Hello there. Welcome to Nerd World Films. In the second part of my new Star Trek series where I discuss the various different Star Trek movies, I'm going to do them in chronological order. If you haven't seen it already, I've already done Star Trek 1, the motion picture. And this one, obviously, you know from both clicking on it and chronologically, is Star Trek 2, The Wrath of Khan, which may be the undisputed champion of the greatest Star Trek movies ever made. And it's almost a little sad that it's the best film so early on in my doing this. It, it, but it is. I mean, come on. It's the most popular Star Trek movie. I mean, there's things like First Contact that come... They're pretty high up there. But this film, it appeals to both Trekkies and non-Trekkies. It even appeals to... Like a friend of mine who is a huge Star Wars fan, I mean huge, and he doesn't like Star Trek at all, loves this film. I don't know really what that says about this film, but it says something. Now, Star Trek 2 is the direct sequel to an episode of the original series, Space Seed, where we were introduced to human augments created in the 20th century, and their leader, Khan Singh. Khan was a ruthless warlord from the late 20th century. He's a product of late 20th century genetic engineering where he's basically the combination of a super athlete and a super genius and then they tweak the DNA to make him stronger, faster, more intelligent. He has twice the average intellect of a human. He's five times physically stronger than a proportionally sized person and he's a big man to begin with. So not only is he five times stronger than he looks, but he looks pretty darn powerful. <clears throat> now he got a little upset with Kirk, Kirk got a little upset with him with the short story after we tried to take over the Enterprise. They then took him and his followers and they set up a colony in a SETI Alpha system, specifically on SETI Alpha 5. But due to unforeseen consequent, uh, actions that would take place in the system, near, thereby the destruction of the neighbouring planet, this world would later be mistaken for SETI Alpha 4, which obviously it was not. SETI Alpha 5 was a paradise, but this world was a desolate wasteland, which if it wasn't for his and his followers' genetically engineered intellect and stamina, they would likely have died in this harsh, unforgiving desert of a world that was created in the wake of the explosion of their neighbouring planet. This was all taking place in the background of the events of a new Federation experiment to create a more efficient terraforming technology that had, unfortunately, the potential to be perverted into a horrific weapon. The kind of thing that even the, the Borg and the Zindi would kind of quiver at, or possibly salivate at, who knows. The Genesis device. Now, the Genesis device was in its name. It was designed to give life. It would take a barren, worthless rock and... In almost instantaneously convert the existing atmosphere and environment and create a matrix of life on this world. It would create a brief, a hu an environment of your choosing. You could design it, so therefore you would terraform it. It would make it Earth-like. It could make the at increased atmospheric density, increase the oxygen, the water, everything. Could, as long as the basic raw materials, I imagine, were there for, the, for this world to potentially be this, it could convert it. But I always did wonder if it's a bit like Mars, where Mars was once perfectly breathable atmosphere and liquid water and is now a ball of rock because it's not really got any long-term survivability, but it did do that for about a billion years, so I suppose it's good enough. Now, the Genesis device was looking for a new testing ground, and the USS Reliant had been dispatched by Starfleet to assist these civilian scientists in their research and locate worlds that were suitable. But these worlds had to be completely dead but still meet some certain criteria, so even if there were microbes, it was out of the question because those microbes could potentially evolve into a sentient race one day. So, Dr. Marcus, the head of researcher of this facility, a regular station, and the head of the Genesis program, would reject any world that had the potential to naturally develop life. It had to be no potential, nothing, just a dead rock, which they could turn. <coughs> Sorry, I'm still a little ill. Yeah. Now, while they were searching for a world, they would eventually find the SETI Alpha system. Now, Chekhov, for whatever reason, never didn't think to himself to mention to the captain that hey, there were these human augments living on a planet nearby. Let's check on them or just be wary, don't get too close to that world. And they didn't notice that there weren't as many planets in the system as what there should be. 
whatever. The, to me, that's a bit of an oversight. I expected more from Starfleet, especially from Chekhov. But anyway, they find Khan and his survivors on the surface of this world. Khan uses the captain and Chekhov to get him and his crew up to the ship. They then presumably murder the crew of the Reliant and keep the captain and Chekhov around because they have little worms that they've put in their ears that make them more susceptible to suggestion and allows them to control what they're doing to a certain degree. After this, once Khan has control of the Reliant, rather than shoot him into deep space, he gathers as much intelligence as he can and he finds out about the Genesis device and makes his way to the regular station, where he then proceeds to kill and torture everyone aboard the station looking for the device. Picking up a distress call from the outpost, Starfleet dispatches the USS Enterprise to investigate. Eventually, the Enterprise finds the Reliant and ends up in a battle with them. When they arrive at the sta and learns that Khan has taken control of it and is the one that has attacked the regular outpost. Now, due to the surprise nature of the attack by Khan, he managed to critically damage the Enterprise and it ended up on reserve power. Now, bear in mind, they were already in the middle of nowhere. No inhabited systems, no Federation outposts or colonies nearby. The Enterprise is alone and they know it. They can't get any help into the area anytime soon. They were already pretty much the only major starship in the area and there's no one else around. They can't allow Khan to escape, but at the same time at the moment, they can't escape him. So thus begins a, a game of cat and mouse. Khan has to retreat to lick his wounds while the Enterprise retreat to lick theirs. Ultimately, at the beginning, Khan has all the upper hands. He, everything's in his favor. He's able to strand Kirk and some of his other major crew members on the surface of the planet and he deliberately maroons them there, thinking that the Enterprise has retreated, not realizing that this is a distraction tactic by Kirk, who's able to outwit Khan due to his greater experience in space combat and warfare. Once Khan has control of the Genesis device and attempts to retreat, Kirk is able to get back to the ship and lure him into the Mutara Nebula, a nebula that levels the playing field between the two vessels, the, the Reliant being in a much more combat-ready situation, and thus begins a basically space version of you know, the hunt for Red October. This is a brilliantly choreographed and shot sequence. Both crews blind. The sensors don't work, their shields don't work. The silence is almost deafening. The tension is constantly rising as these two vessels try to almost bump into each other. Each one trying to hope that they get the first shot because whoever gets the first shot in this is going to win. Whoever can break the other first. And it's, it's a beautiful scene. It's so well done. It's, it's a tense and paced combat. It's not just a sort of, you know, J.J. Abrams or Michael Bay style just blow shit up like crazy. It's, it's got subtlety to it. You can f see the strategy that both sides are using to try and outwit the other. And it's, it has a feeling of, you don't really know which way this is going to go. Because so far, Khan has been kicking Kirk's ass. And, but Kirk keeps coming back. And that's all, this is Kirk. I mean, there's, there's every chance in this that Khan might win. Khan might escape. Kirk might end up broken inside this nebula, for all we know. I mean, in hindsight, we know that because this film was released in 1982, but we, at the time, wouldn't have known. The film does it so well, and it makes the payoff, the victory, when Kirk finally, which is as much luck as strategy, gets the upper hand on Khan again, because Khan thinks a spot puts it two-dimensionally. He's still thinking 20th century warfare, where most of it was still on a flat surface on land or in the ocean. Aerial warfare and even and submerged warfare, they were... They existed, of course, but three-dimensional warfare of that nature was still relatively young for Khan's time. By Kirk's time, it had been around for centuries. He was used to it. He'd never fought two-dimensional playing fields, really. He'd never been infantry. He'd always been navy, and navies in the 23rd century, they, they're in space. Khan simply wasn't used to that, despite his intellect, and Kirk was able to take advantage of that weakness. And he was ultimately able to defeat Khan. Khan would then detonate the Genesis device within the nebula in a last-ditch attempt with it aboard his crippled vessel, most of his crew dead, no longer able to fight. 
he wasn't going to be captured alive, his attempt to kill himself and hopefully take Kirk and his crew with him did fail, but it was a savage, savage thing to do. And Ricardo Montalban, you were, you were the real Khan. I mean, that performance was magnificent, truly. And this film is a benchmark for Star Trek. It's a brilliant, brilliant movie. So well written. There's, there's, I can't criticize it at all. I can't find anything. I mean, I'm sure there are. I'm sure people don't like. There are people that don't like it, and I'm sure it's got its flaws. But let's not forget, this film has one of the most memorable and possibly memed sequences, also in the history of Star Trek: the death and self-sacrifice of Spock, a, a death that is earned, that has it has a feeling of it's like you've you've known these characters, you've known them for years. You've, you've seen their friendship, the strengths, its weaknesses, its good times, its bad times. It's a death that felt earned, a sacrifice that felt real. Not just lazy, throwaway character, just a real, important member of the crew. <clears throat> and he sacrifices himself for his friends, his colleagues, his co-workers, and for the greater good. It... I know people that cry at that scene. It is so well done. This film may have a lot of generated a lot of 21st century memes. It may sometimes have the piss taken out of it, but really, you go back and rewatch this thing, it's a really magnificent piece of movie history and writing and cinematography and the, the soundtrack, the lighting, the acting, the script, the direction. Everything about this film is just perfect. It is done so well, right from beginning to end. You've got a defined three series of events. You've got the beginning of setup of the characters, your universe, and where you are. The middle bit where you see it all that all go wrong, and the rise of the villain and the arrival of the hero for the hero's downfall for the third act of the return of the hero to defeat the evil and restore save the Federation, basically. Or, or post potentially save the Federation, because who knows what a bunch of super-powered superhumans running around with a weapon of mass destruction and a heavily armed warship would have actually done long-term. Regardless, brilliant film. It's so well made. Now, in short, this film is one of the best cast and best written films in the Star Trek franchise, especially out of the first six movies it's definitely the standout it's the one that most people go back to you've got exceptionally good casting in the form of ricardo montalban re reprising the role of khan singh from the episode space seed of the original series you've got william shatner and others just all again coming back reprising their roles and you've got what felt like at the time was going to be the real send-off for spock a fan favorite character veteran from the original series and from the motion picture. Everything about this film just had this sense of grandeur and spectacle about it. Interesting, as a, as a Star Trek fan, I'm sure you're probably quite aware, but I always find this quite a fascinating movie. You watch the first six movies, and this is the only film, the only one, where the Enterprise fires its phasers. I don't know why, but every time I hear that, I still, I have, to, still have to think about it. And there is no example of the Enterprise firing its phasers in any of the other five movies. Always it's torpedoes in those films. It's the only one. Back on track. This has to be, for me, my favourite Star Trek movie of all time. <clears throat> and possibly the best Star Trek movie of all time. That's not to say that all the ones that came after it are inferior or not as good. I mean, they're all good. Five. They're mostly good, but <clears throat> there has to be a standout, and for me, it's always Star Trek 2. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I love Ben Cumberbatch. He elevates pretty much anything he's in, but he wasn't Khan. And I'm sorry, I actually don't mind <clears throat> Into Darkness. I don't hate it. I don't like it a lot. I don't really like Beyond. But Into Darkness irked me. Mostly because J.J. Abrams lied about whether or not he was going to be Khan. John, he was supposed to just be some villain, a new villain. 
I would have been fine with it if you really think about it, any of the augments, all of them were genetically enhanced supermen. Any single one of them. Their super blood they used to reanimate Tribbles and Kirk. That could have come from any of the augments. It didn't have to be Khan. This guy could have just been one of Khan's followers. He didn't have to be Khan. And I've always tried in my head, Khan, to try to make believe that he wasn't really Khan. That when he was woke up, he just lied to them so that he was protecting his his leader. And he's like, no, no, I'm Khan. That's not Khan. I'm Khan. He's, he's, forget him. He's nobody. He's just my decoy. That's what I like to try and believe, but I know that's not what J.J. Abrams wrote. That isn't what it was. He just lied and copied Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan and tried to remake it in a very bad way. A man that, I'm sorry, I have very little respect for as a director, and I'm sorry to anyone who likes his films, but the guy doesn't know how to end the movie, and he doesn't know how to write something original. <clears throat> Simple fact. I don't, I don't real much care if people disagree with that opinion. It's, it's my opinion, and I have it. That said, I do actually quite like his Star Wars movies, and I do actually quite like his Star Trek movies, and I really liked Being Human. TV series he made, so it's not that I hate everything he does, I just don't think he's as original and great as a director as he's often portrayed to be. <clears throat> and you take Into Darkness and, and The Wrath of Khan, compare those two films, because they're, they're, Into Darkness is a spiritual remake of, in, of The Wrath of Khan, and it's it doesn't hold up, it's not as good. It doesn't have the payoff, it doesn't have the build-up or the tension that this film has. So with that said, I'm going to move on to my nerd score, which... I like to give these films and in this case this one is getting the fanfare it's getting six out of six it is just fantastic I nerd all over this movie it's great and if you're not a Star Trek fan I do recommend you watch it because you won't find a better film it's not just because it's it's not a good just a good Star Trek film it's a good film and there's there's the distinction with this one a, a trouble a lot of Star Trek films have is people view them as a Star Trek movie. This isn't just a Star Trek movie. This is a film that is a very good film. It just happens to be set in space. Now, with all that said, if you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. Uh, I have a sec another channel called Nerd World. If you want to move over there, check out some of the videos on that channel. Or if you've come from that channel, welcome. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe over there. Comment down below what you think of Star Trek 2, The Wrath of Khan, or what you think of J.J. Abrams. I always like to hear different opinions. And um, with that said, thanks for watching. If you made it all the way to the end, you're a wonderful human being, and bye-bye.